My name is Sam Vaknin and I'm the author of Malignant Self Love, Narcissism Revisited. The United States State Department's designation of rogue state periodically falls in and out of favor. It is used to refer to countries hostile to the United States, usually with authoritarian, brutal, and venal regimes, and predilection to ignore international law and conventions to encourage global or local terrorism and the manufacture and proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Most rogue states are not failed states. This distinction is very important. Let's go back for a while. An immature state is a polity whose elites are dysfunctional, corrupt, and narcissistic, whose economy is not viable, frequently dependent on handouts, and whose coherence is threatened by a lack of social consensus. Immature states typically lack political traditions, change agents, goal-oriented bureaucracies, and institutional memory. Consequently, the denizens of immature states are often xenophobic and insular. A failed state is a country whose government has no control and cannot exercise a monopoly on the legitimate use of power and force over a substantial part of its territory or its citizenry. Such a state is continuously and successfully challenged by private military power, terrorists, insurgents, warlords, militias. Its promulgations and laws are futile and inapplicable. With the exception of the first criterion, hostility towards Pax Americana, some scholars claim that the United States itself is a rogue state. For instance, William Bloom, in his book, Rogue State, a Guide to the World's Only Superpower, and Prestovitz, Clyde Prestovitz, in his book, Rogue Nation. Admittedly, the United States' unilateralist, thuggish, and capricious foreign policy represents constant threat to world peace and stability. But labeling the United States a rogue state may be overdoing it. it the United States better fits the profile of what I call a semi-failed state. A semi-failed state is a country whose government maintains all the trappings and appearances of power, legitimacy, and control. Its army and police are integral and operative. Its institutions function. Its government and parliament promulgate laws, and its courts enforce these laws. It is not challenged by any competing military structure within its recognized borders. Yet, the semi-failed state, while going through the motions, is dead on its feet. It is a political and societal zombie. It functions mainly due to inertia and lack of better or clear alternatives. Its population is disgruntled, hostile, and suspicious. Other countries regard such semi-failed states with derision, fear, and abhorrence. It is rotting from the inside and doomed to implode rather than explode. In a semi-failed state, high crime rates, rampant venality, nepotism, and cronyism affect the government's ability to enforce laws and implement programs. The government reacts by adding layers of intransigence, intransigent and opaque bureaucracy to an already sclerotic and un unwieldy mammoth. The institutions of this semi-failed state are hopelessly politicized and thus biased, distrusted, compromised. The semi-failed state's judiciary is in a state of decrepit decline as unqualified beneficiaries of patronage join its ranks. And the result of all these abysmal developments is social fragmentation, as traditional and local leaders, backed by angry and rebellious constituents, take matters into their own hands. Centrifugal politics supplants statehood, and the nation is unable to justly and effectively balance the competing claims of the center versus the periphery. The utter but insidious institutional failure that typifies a semi-failed state is usually exposed with the total disarray that follows an emergency, such as a natural disaster or a terrorist attack. To deflect criticism 
and in a vain attempt to resume to reunite its fracturing populace, the semi-failed state often embarks on military adventures cloaked as self-defense or geopolitical necessity. Empire building is a prime indicator of looming and imminent disintegration. Foreign aggression replaces reconstruction and rational policy making at home. The United States prior to the Civil War, the USSR between 1956 and 1982, Federal Yugoslavia after 1989, and Nazi Germany are the most obvious examples of semi-failed states. So, back to our question. Is the United States a semi-failed state? Let's look at the facts. Number one, empire building and foreign aggression. Its, neighbor, its neighbors always perceived the United States as an imminent security risk. Ask Mexico, half of whose territory was captured by successive and aggressive American administrations. The two world wars transformed the United States into a global threat rather than a regional one. It is able and willing to project power to protect its interests or perceived interests and disseminate its brand of exceptionalist, missionary, liberal capitalism. In the last 150 years, the United States has repeatedly militarily attacked and provoked other peaceful and pacified nations far and near. To further its often economic ends, the United States has not refrained from encouraging and using terrorism in various parts of the globe. It has developed and deployed weapons of mass destruction and is still the biggest arms manufacturer and trader in the world. It has repeatedly reneged on its international obligations and breached multinational and international laws and conventions. Number two, dysfunctional institutions. Hurricane Katrina in August, September 2005 exposed the frailty and lack of preparedness of FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, to some extent the National Guard. It brought into sharp relief the cancerous politicization of the chronic infested federal government. FEMA was only the latest in a long chain of failed institutions. The Securities and Exchange Commission coped poorly with virulent corruption and malfeasance in Wall Street. The FDA, Food and Drug Administration, capitulated in the face of commercial and political pressures and neglected to remove them from the market malfunctioning medical devices and drugs with lethal side effects. The EPA, EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, has sacrificed America's nature reserves to business interests. A heavily politicized Supreme Court legitimized manifestly tainted election results and made a president out of the loser of the popular vote. This, the disenfranchisement of minorities, the poor and ex-convicts, is now in full swing. The legislature, both houses of Congress, are deadlocked and paralyzed owing to partisanship and corruption. Witness America's near default in 2011. The executive either ignores laws passed by the legislative branch of government, President Bush issued well over 750 presidential statements, effectively obviating many of, of the acts passed by Congress. Another strategy is for the executive to actively encroach on congressional turf, for instance, by sending the FBI to search the offices of elected, elected representatives or by declaring war without seeking Congress's approval in contravention of the, of, uh, the law. The organs of government of the United States now function only when exposed to acute embarrassment and revolted public opinion. Witness the Tea Party. Private firms and charities sprout to fulfill the gaps, and an amazing and incredibly large lobbying industry is there to cater to business interests. This leads us to the last point, the national consensus. Americans long mistook the institutional stability of the political system, guaranteed by the Constitution, for a national consensus. They actually believe that institutional stability guarantees national consensus, that institutional firmness and durability are the national consensus. The reverse, as we know, is true. It takes a national consensus to yield stable and functioning institutions, not the other way around. No social structure, no matter how venerable and veteran, can resist the winds of change in public sentiment and consensus. Hurricane Katrina 
again demonstrated the unbridgeable divides in American society between rich and poor, black and white. But this time, the rift runs deeper. The Bush administration was the first since the Civil War to dare to change the fundamental rules of a political, ca political game, for instance by seeking to abolish the filibuster in the Senate, and by the profligacy of recess appointments of judges and officials. Its instincts in reflexes were elitist, and democratic, and violent. Uh, the Bush administration was delusional, and its brand of fanatic religiosity was not well received, even among the majority of Americans who are believers. Additionally, the Bush administration was openly and unabashedly corrupt, and ridden with nepotism and cronyism. To the dismay of most Americans, nothing has changed with the Obama administration. It is a continuation of Bush by other, more colorful means. Yet Bush, unlike Nixon, is, was not an aberration. Bush was unlikely to ever have been impeached, as, as is Obama. Bush was overwhelmingly re-elected, even when his quagmire war in Iraq unraveled and the self-enrichment and paranoia of his close circle became public secret. And this is the new and true face of at least half of America, to the horror and dismay of the other half. Liberals against conservatives. If the history of the United States is any judge, these two camps are unlikely to sit back and naval gaze. Semi-failed states typically disintegrate. A bloodied, perhaps even nuclear second civil war, is in the cards. Not now, in 50 years, not in 50 years, in 100. Should the United States devolve into its constituent states, the world will breathe a sigh of relief. A European Union-like economic zone between the parts of the former United States is bound to be far more pacific and to contribute towards stability and prosperity, something its malignant former incarnation, the United States, had so signally failed to do.